Welcome to God of Ruth. This is Will Sanchez. Thank you for tuning in. My very special guest today is Matt Ropers from Peloton. We're all seeing the TV commercials for Peloton. Did you know that New York City is the only place in the world you can find a Peloton studio where you can ride with Matt and the other gifted instructors, either in real time or if you happen to have your own machine, whenever you can make the time. Matt is a pioneer in many ways. He was one of the gifted instructors at the Mile High Run Club in Soho when it opened up almost three years ago. Well, thanks for having me, Well, I appreciate it. Happy, great to be here. Great, great. I'll never forget the time we met at the Mile High Run Club. Oh, you yeah. were one of the most athletic instructors <laughs> there. High energy, very enthusiastic, oh. really a great experience to be there with yeah. you and the other instructors. So, it's a great place to be. There's some great instructors there. I know. I highly recommend the Mile High Run Club. <laughs> Thanks. It was a pioneer because uh, who, who knew that treadmill running was going to take off? Yeah, and they did it in a, in a great way. They are doing it in a great way, and it was a lot of fun to coach. And it's, uh, it was fun. It was fun because you felt like you were creating something that's never been done before. Well, before we go into your current uh, gig oh, at Peloton, <laughs> yeah. let's introduce you to our audience. Cool. Tell us where you were born and something about uh, your growing up years. Cool. Yeah, I was born in Ohio, and I was raised in Marietta, Georgia. I grew up there. I was, I, my parents kept me out of trouble because they're like, Matt, we're gonna push you basically in every sport possible. So I played hockey, I played basketball, I played baseball. My dad wanted me to be a professional baseball player. <laughs> I'm convinced. Uh, I was never allowed to play football, even though football was like religion down there. And then, um, and so, and then soccer became quickly became uh, the big thing in my family. And so it was really soccer and tennis for a long time. Throughout high school, I eventually had to to narrow down exactly what I wanted to do with my athletic life. And um, I found myself, first it was soccer, and then I, I, uh, I ran into the Georgia State cross-country and track coach while training for soccer. And he invited me to, to come out and, and trap for the, for the Georgia State cross-country and track team. So uh -huh. I decided to spend my last, few, uh, last seasons in, uh, in high school training to go to college and run. Now, I really owe that to my sister because she's one that she's like, Matt, you're not going to be out of shape and play soccer in high school, so you do cross country and tra uh, cross country to stay fit for soccer in the spring. So that's how I started running, and then I ended up really enjoying it, and that was mostly because of the the coaching and my fr and the people I met and the friends, the friendships I made. And then in college, you said you, that's Georgia, where the running really started. And then yeah, in college, I, that's why I started running much more serious, Georgia State University. And what was your major? I did a major in accounting, and then I also did a major in finance. And then I ended up doing a fifth year and got a master's in accounting. Wow. So what is it about numbers that you like? It's funny you say that because when I was in school, I was torn between going to, to trying to be a physician or going to business. And um, it was about the time that Enron collapsed and all, all that stuff just happened. And there was this big focus on accounting. My parents, I knew that they were investing a lot of money in me and time in me. And I was like, I, I got to come out of school and have a good job. And make money. I don't know what I want to do with my life. <laughs> okay, nobody does at that age. Yeah, so I was like, all right, well, I'm doing well here, and and it seems to be something challenging. And like I've always, I just found finance or finance fascinating. And uh, and so even when I went, I ended up going into it account, into accounting. I put a, a finance spin on it by auditing um, financial services companies, especially broker dealers. So after college. Throughout college, I was part of a, a business fraternity called Beta Alpha Psi, and they gave us great exposure to all the accounting firms in, in the Atlanta area. And uh, having gone and studied abroad in undergrad, I, I wanted to see the rest of the world, and, and uh, so I was very interested in New York City. It's definitely a foreign country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like, I was like, I need something. I need to be stimulated by going somewhere else. Oh, so okay. I, uh, Where did you go when you did that overseas trip? New Zealand. Really? Yeah. New Zealand. I was My there for gosh. six months. Well, that's, uh, I know a little bit about New Zealand. Dunedin, by any chance? Dunedin, New Zealand. Is that the capital? No. But for me, from being a Georgia boy, it's like the, the Athens of, uh, of New Zealand. It's a college town. <laughs> really? So I, I surfed and skied and, 
and tried very hard to get, get my work done in school. <laughs> the skiing in New Zealand? Yeah, because oh, in the mountains. I what guess. attracted me to New Zealand was that oh, one, I can't, I wasn't going to be able to to continue running competitively and go someplace for a year where I could really learn another language. So I only had six months. So I go, well, let's go have fun. And so I could go surf and ski in the same day, sold. Everyone in New Zealand I talked to, they're like, you've done more here in your six months than we, we've done in a lifetime. So, because I, I just- well, you were only 19 or 20 or something. Yeah, yeah, something like that. That's excellent. All right, so you graduated from school. It looked like it took five years to get that extra degree in yeah, accounting. Because I needed that to be get my certification as a CPA. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then where did you land your first- job between my fourth and fifth year I did an internship in Manhattan with KPMG and uh, secured a job up here after after my my fifth year of uh, being a TA and teaching accounting as well as completing my master's came up here I worked for KPMG and the financial services audit and I did that for about over three and a half wow. years so how are auditors treated when you came in to do an audit <laughs> <laughs> Well, it depends on the it depends on the company and depends on the situation. But um, I focused on financial services and I worked with big banks, and so you know it's they're used to it okay. at that point. Right, right. And did that require Don't, a lot of computer skills? Well, you had to. You had to learn a lot because when you work with uh, banks, it, a lot there's there's a lot of financial models. Uh, that we we're looking at and a lot of the times those models are way over my head and so we had to bring in experts uh, that, that would look at the models for us and tell us what was actually happening um, and so at the end of the day I had to understand how essentially a trade went from the actual trade execution all the way to the financial statements and tell that story and why we think that the financial statements are reported correctly and everything else. I saw a movie called The Accountant. I, don't know. I need to see that. I haven't you seen gotta it. see it. <laughs> I haven't I seen it. I gotta see it. it. I um, see it. Was it Ben Affleck? Oh, oh, he's so he's cool. He's fantastic. Uh, you know, he makes the accounting field look very sexy. And that's the thing, when I went through school, everyone's like, accounting is so sexy. And I was like, academically fascinating. The work is hard. <laughs> it is hard. But it, right. it is fascinating because people, it's a, it's a fantastic job because people teach you. I learned so much in my time at KPMG. It was a fantastic experience. I never really saw myself being in accounting the rest of my life. I sort of figured it was a stepping stone. And um, I was dead set at that time of, I really could see myself in finance. And so I had the opportunity to go to Goldman Sachs and, and work in merchant banking as a senior analyst. Merchant banking. So what is a merchant bank? <laughs> Big picture is, uh, is the, the bank's money co-investing with the client's money uh, on, on some, some big investments. And we primarily focused on real estate and corporate investments. Oh, okay. So if Trump wanted to do a deal, <laughs> a casino in Nevada, you guys we might get involved? Something like that. And it, it, it was, uh, especially about the time I came in around 2011 with Dodd-Frank and everything else, it was a... An interesting time. <laughs> oh, okay, so that's right. So yeah. Dodd Frank was in full bloom. They they reinstated yeah, well, it. Yeah, well, they're you know talking about it and going through it and it hasn't quite come down yet. And so we were you know okay, how's that going to go down? Yeah, I left just over a year into it because I uh, I was I was again I was convinced I was going to go into into finance, and so I was taking I was getting ready to go to go take my GMATs and then apply. And I and I was in I was in this Manhattan GMAT class with this finance fantastic like the the people they have teaching those classes are fabulous. Uh, Jason, one of the, the I forget, I think it's Jason Jirasi or the uh, long snapper for the Giants is in my class. Really? And so, uh, but I, I looked around. I go, I'm in the wrong place, and uh, I I don't belong in finance, and I don't belong in accounting. I need to figure something else out. I was like, what? 25, 26, oh, okay. at least. You're still young. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Your parents are probably going, when are you going to get married? Give us a family. Being from Georgia, you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> but my, luckily, my parents have a lot of patience. So after that, I, uh, at that time, I had always been doing fitness coaching on the side. And uh, that was sort of like my happy place was, you know, whenever I got injured or whatever else from training and racing, I would coach. I coached an all-female triathlon team at startup called Team Lipstick. 
which is a, a great name for an all-female triathlon team. But having had a sister that was big in athletics, um, I thought it was a great fit. I had a fantastic time coaching them. I could see you having a fantastic time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everyone thinks of to be able to connect and connect and coach uh, women. It's it's very different from men, and I think it's a skill set because there there's different drivers. Uh, absolutely, they're very very social. Yeah, but in general, I just I just really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed the uh, the people that are on the team, and and it, I, I'm friends with most of them to this day. Okay, so yeah. you develop you good people skills when you're around the team lipstick. Oh, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but we met, like I mentioned, at the Mile High yeah. Run Club. He was yeah. one, of the, uh, one of the initial instructors there. Yeah. All fabulous instructors. They did so, a great job of getting instructors. So how did you make that connection? A short story is I, uh, I needed to, uh, I got into group fitness training um, f because of Team Lipstick, and that became my sort of avenue out of Goldman Sachs. And... Um, and then uh, one one gym led to another. When I went from I started off at you know Asphalt Green, even the YMCA, and then I and then I would coach a coach there, and that was sort of my marketing tool for personal training, and to to uh, to get people onto teams and whatever else that I coached for. And so it was just a, it's like sort of a web of make that's how you make money as a coach. Okay. And uh, and I eventually uh, a friend of mine referred me over to the people of Mile High Run Club, and they. Uh, they're kind enough to bring me in over there and uh, interview me, and I got to see them start up from the start up from uh, the sawdust. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, I had Deborah here as a guest. She's fantastic. She's yeah. fantastic. I saw an opportunity, and I kept telling her the only place I've gone to, you still had that new car smell to oh, the yeah. place. That was fantastic, Gosh. and like all good things, you had to move on. So, what was the next step after Mile High? Well. At that time, I was finishing up a post-baccalaureate program because I was going through that question of what am I going to do with the rest of my life, and uh, I, I went back. I went back originally in college. I was thinking about medicine or business, and I knew that I wanted to be working with people in a in a in a mentally stimulating environment, and I wanted to help people for a living. I wasn't. I quickly found that money was not was a driver in my success, but only to a, a little bit. And at a certain point, I needed to feel fulfilled and like I was doing something good for people. So anyways, I did that post-baccalaureate program at NYU. I finished that. Um, I started applying to med schools. And at the same time, I wanted a backup uh, in case I did not get into med school for whatever reason. And so I, I ended up going into streaming fitness and, and looking into taking my workouts that had been successful in the group fitness environment and streaming them uh, legally which is very important. That's hard, hard to do. Legally. Legally. Streaming. So Streaming. that's like internet uh, That's like taking your, taking your workouts with music from real artists behind it and getting licensing for that music and, and doing that uh, for a business. And so I ended up launching an app uh, called CoachCast with my brother-in-law, who's a pilot. <laughs> he, he was my developer. He's a brilliant individual that just picked up a book and taught himself how to code. So they live in Spain, if I remember. Yeah, you're right. My sister and him and moved their family out to Spain just to make sure the little kids knew Spanish, which I think is fantastic. Wow. <laughs> they must love Spanish food and, oh my gosh, uh, and the yeah. language. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so, all right, so you developed this app. So he was the developer, and you were, yeah. since you know, knew all about coaching and, and group dynamics. Yeah, I managed that side of the business, and he did the the tech side of the business. I ended up getting, getting an acceptance to med school, which I delayed for a year because I, I thought our business had tremendous potential, um, and I thought we were just getting off the ground. And within that year, Peloton approached me, and um, you know, at the time I saw them as a competitor. I was like, who are these people? <laughs> and I did some more research in the company, and uh, I learned a lot more about the company and the the CEO and and everyone else and sort of the direction the company is heading. And I did some look at what capital they're raising, and I said, "There's no way I can compete with this. <laughs> I'm definitely interested in in in, in working." Oh, with oh so they had an app that competed. I was very audio fitness based streaming, whereas theirs is video, and um, and it was it was excellent. It was so excellent. Theirs is visually oriented. You were more. I was more audio-based. Uh, it was pure. Ear. Yeah, audio-based. Okay. 
So they approached you, but how did they hear about you? I mean, you're not exactly yeah. in Yellow Pages, you know, <laughs> available yeah. for hire. No, that's a great question. One of the early investors' wives would, went to my class uh, at Equinox uh, down in Tribeca, and, um, and so she referred me over to uh, the content team, and uh, that's how and then they started coming to my classes. Excellent, and, and excellent. Then, the cycling class. Yeah, at Equinox. I, oh, Equinox. Well, yeah, it's yeah. a great club. Peloton is extremely interesting. This is your Peloton. This is Robin. Robin is your instructor today. Robin is not going to go easy on you. This is you attacking the hill, crushing the flats, climbing your way through the pack. This is Peloton. Uh, and so really, at the end of the day, it's to provide an experience like, like being in a, in a cycling class. And you know, we speak to the camera, and we, we coach you through the camera, and we can see the home rider's data. And that's what we call it, everyone that's riding from home. Uh, they buy a bike, they set it up in their house, and it connects to the internet. Uh, they have the ability on their bike to, to attend classes live. And then, uh, or they can take classes, what we call on demand. So every class is recorded, or, and you can you can come in and take one of those classes. And it has a leaderboard that's uh, you can compete based on total output. And it's a diverse group of twelve instructors, and we're all different in our own ways, and all they're all good but different, and which is fun because I mean we all learn from each other. Absolutely, just like Mao High, you all learn from each other. So is there a music piped in? Oh yeah. Uh, music is very important. Yeah, when I looked at the company, I was just like, wow, they, they're using real music like I am. You know, it's a home run. So obviously everybody has a different taste in music. So what is your flair? Is it? Is oh, it, gosh. Is it rock and roll? Is it reggae? I don't oh, know. What, okay. It what depends on the workout. So my whole big thing is I, I teach power zone training. Uh, so whenever I do a power zone class, it's usually an eclectic mix of you name it. Uh, I like... Uh, you know, remixes from EDM uh, to house uh, to rock, you name it. But then we'll do theme rides. Like today, I did a rock theme ride where I played uh, some some Seether, some Leonard Skinner, some uh, you know. It's it's all over. So it's really, uh, I guess, growing up, I was lucky to to sort of cultivate a love for most types of music. Okay, so, so. besides being a, a gifted athlete, they're also looking for somebody that knows their music. Because it's if, a degree you're, if you in don't music. have, you're not going to, <laughs> but they're a great athlete, they're not going to hire you to be, to be <laughs> as an instructor. You gotta do your homework. Because you're, yeah. you gotta be a DJ. Yeah. People are writing, both in a studio, some people yep. could come in and write there. Yep. And then people at home, so, how many people can you monitor? I mean, hundreds? Oh, gosh. I know one of the instructors, it was her thousandth ride. It had over 1,500 people in it, riding live. One of the things that makes it so great is that um, online and through social media, the instructors have a lot of interaction with the community. When I was with the team in training, the coach had this gift that everybody on the team, and we had people from never done you know, a step to veterans returning. Oh, yeah. But we each of us felt like we were the star of the <laughs> team. And if you're gifted enough, you can make, even down to 1500, everyone feel like they're the star of the group. Yeah. The cool thing is, so at, like a great example is after class, on my Peloton Facebook page, people, I'll ask people to post their output graphs. Output graphs displays what their output looked like, their out, uh, wattage it looked like throughout class. And I can say, okay, then, you did great here, you did great here, I would look to improve here. You can give feedback that way. Where are you located in New York? Down 23rd Street, between 6th and 7th. They could go there seven days a week. Yep. Is it 24 hours? Or what's oh, definitely. <laughs> I'm not teaching class at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> no, our earliest class is because I teach at 6 a.m. 6 a.m. Uh, and then we have uh, classes that go as late as about 8.30 p.m. Oh, okay. But there's classes all day of different lengths. Okay. And also you have a sample machine because my wife tried it out. Oh, yeah. And instantly fell in love with it. Like she pedaled like yeah. two weeks and said, okay, I want one. But he plans opening up another studio? Or? I'm not quite sure. New, New Zealand? Oh, who knows? Go That'd be great. <laughs> That'd be great. I mean, I'd, I'd sign up first. So they have boutique stores where they can people uh, you can 
all around the nation. You can come in and learn about the bike, buy some clothes, et cetera, and, and just get a feel for what the bike is and the okay. company is. So there's 20 stores like that, but only one studio, and that's in Manhattan. You were wearing a shirt that caught my eye. Oh, yeah. And it said, every mother counts. Yes, sir. Tell us about yeah. your involvement with Every Mother Counts. Man, oh man. Well, it's a long story how I ended up coaching for them, but basically I, I'm their in-house coach. Um, so I write the training programs um, and provide as much feedback as I can. And, you know, my job is to essentially coach. But it's, um, it's a great organization that I, you know, I've met Christy Turlington, who's it's her company, and then um, Alex Newbold, who's the CFO. And I, I've known them, and they actually came to my Mile High classes all the time, uh, as well as when I worked with New York Health and Racket. Uh, so it's sort of been a long relationship, and uh, and yeah, I'm a big supporter of the company. I wear I wear my Every Mother Counts hat shirt in my Peloton classes all the time. I race with their clothing. Uh, I just think that making childbirth safe in developing countries is just such a fantastic cause, and I just really believe in what they're doing. Absolutely, that's great. I had I had one of their ambassadors here from the okay. uh, ambassador for Every Mother Counts. She works for Charity Miles. Okay, that supports. Every mother counts. Okay, and uh, she, she was such a great spokesperson. She okay. believes in the cause that yeah. for her 26th birthday, she organized a marathon in Manhattan. Where she ran it and had her friends support her oh, cool. to raise funds for Every Mother Counts. Uh, she runs for the Dashing Whippets. Oh, great, great team. Uh, great and team. when I saw that, well, I got to invite this 26-year-old. I mean, not too many 26-year-old would decide to do their birthdays, you know, this yeah. way. It's, it is a fantastic uh, nonprofit. So yeah. that's what attracted me was that, uh, that every, that shirt, I said, okay, all right, so you're the coach everyone, that's what a cool job that is. Everyone, everyone sees that shirt, they're like, why are you, what, what? <laughs> but it's, well, we, since you come from teen lipstick, it makes sense you yeah. would coach for every mother counts. So somehow you're True. attracted to the True. female side of things. True, well, you know. So this is good that you're in touch with your feminine side. <laughs> not, every, not every man is comfortable with that. No, it's true, but it, you know, just, uh, it's all about the cause. And, and, and having gone, I actually uh, did a lot of volunteer work in, um, in gynecologic oncology as well as um, OBGYN, and with anesthesiology, that's where I did a lot of my uh, um, volunteering to go to med school, and I learned a lot, uh, especially about childbirth and uh, and ha and the, the the troubles that can happen, and everything else. And it's really what you know. The more I learned about it, I was like, that's this this needs to be this needs to exist. Oh yeah, yeah. And they got a lot of great spokesperson. I saw Scott Jurek. The work that every mother counts is doing really hits home with us and our own personal experience. A year ago, almost to the day we were in the Canary Islands, I did that race and it was really hard for me. A few days after we got home, we went for a couple of training runs. I just like didn't feel good. My ears started ringing and everything just started spinning. I kind of collapsed on the ground going in and out of consciousness. So we get to the ER, this doctor comes in and he's like, do you realize that you're pregnant? And we're like, no. Well, you're like seven weeks pregnant and it's ectopic and we have to terminate it. You've lost a half a liter to a liter of blood and we're gonna have to have surgery like right now. Here we are in, you know, a modern city. We have access to a hospital and an ER and you know, even then, you know, Jenny almost died. And, and I mean, it's really scary to think that happens in remote places where women don't have access to a hospital or ER one mile away. And if they do, they're not getting in a car. They have to walk that distance. Matt, did you run any marathons? I have. Tell us about the best one. Oh, gosh. Uh, my best marathon was probably the most humorous one. It was my first one. <laughs> my, first, my, my first marathon was out in... Uh, in California, and uh, just outside of Los Angeles. This thing is Long Beach Marathon. And the, uh, it's my first marathon ever, and I didn't really understand nutrition because I was used to racing 5Ks oh, in college. Big difference. So I, I ate a bowl of Cheerios in the morning, <laughs> and I went out there, completely bonked at mile 13, and uh, someone handed me a gel, and that's how I learned about gels. Uh, so I got a gel and somehow brought it together and ran a 313. 
<laughs> and uh, and the, the kicker of it was that they mixed up the chips between my mom and myself. So, so she ran 313. So she ran a 313, and she won her division, and she received a massive check in the mail. <laughs> and the statute of limitation is over, right? And she spent the money, oh, and she sent it back. Oh, and then and it, it, it kept going. And then there's an article in the newspaper about my mom in the local <laughs> newspaper. So everyone's calling her house, being like. Where did that come from? <laughs> so I was like, uh, so my mom sent the money back and was blushing like crazy. Uh, but but that was my first marathon, and That's I'll a never forget story. it. She's not going to forget it either. <laughs> yeah, no. So well, it's listen, on that note, yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks in. for having me. It's my pleasure. So thank you. Mm -hmm.